Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host Juma Iraqi and joining me today is Menno Henselmans from Bayesian Bodybuilding. Menno, how are you doing today? I'm great, you? It's so good to be on the show again. Thank you so much for agreeing to do another podcast and uh, we actually did the first episode of Iraqi Nutrition was with, uh, with, uh, with you Menno. We talked about uh, advanced training. And that was a really popular episode and we have a lot of views on it on, on YouTube. So great to have you back. Uh, for people that haven't watched that episode, could you please give us a brief introduction about yourself? Sure. Uh, so my name is Menno Enselmans. I'm the director of Bayesian Bodybuilding. Uh, I started off as a one-man company basically, but it's now an eight-man company. It's going really well. Um, the rationale for it is that I combined what I learned as a business consultant specialized in advanced statistical data analyses and what I learned during my education as an economist and a statistician and a scientist. And I apply that to bodybuilding, which has always been my passion, uh, strength training. And it's just an evidence based form of fitness. It's very scientific. And you could summarize the word Bayesian as it refers to Thomas Bayes, a statistician that formed these methods. You could summarize it as a, a system, a mathematical system that specifies how to form the most reasonable beliefs based on the available data. So that's what I do. And it's like I said, it's a form of evidence based fitness. Excellent. And you also have an online course that's been going really well and it's really popular. Uh, to my understanding, this has been uh, um, been in English so far, but it's been also translated to Dutch. Yeah, it's uh, going really well. Got uh, about 150 course members per uh, round in the English variant. We're now expanding to both Spanish and French, actually. And there's al already a Dutch version that's also doing really well. Uh, it's pr probably already the most uh, renowned education in the Netherlands now as a certification program. And um, might be a Norwegian version coming too. Uh, that's set for 2018. So yeah, it's going great. Very good, Menno. I'm so happy for you because I know that the information that you pro provide is high quality. So, uh, and your foot has recovered 100% uh, as well? Yeah, so I, I dropped 400 pounds, uh, for those that don't know, uh, on it um, beginning of 2016. And uh, it recovered reasonably well. That was during contest prep, so unfortunate timing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I still did the show. Um, Looked all right, but um, it took a long while for it to get back to 100%. I recently posted on Facebook that I'm now squatting over 400 pounds again. So it's like the it's like the milestone. I dropped 400 pounds on my foot, and now I'm back to squatting over 400 pounds. So that's really good. Nice. It's, it's good for me at least. You know, I, I've got many clients that are stronger, but personally for me, that's uh, what I consider good for myself. Yeah, perfect. So happy for you that you've fully recovered from it. So. Um, before we start, just to mention, this podcast will be available on YouTube in video format, but you can also listen to it on iTunes if you prefer that. So, Menno, today's topic is uh, metabolic damage, and that is a term that's got a lot of attention the last couple of years in the fitness industry. You recently did a review on this, and we'll um, get back to that later in the podcast, but let's talk first about what type of adaptations that may occur during a caloric restriction? Right. Uh, adaptation is indeed uh, the correct term here. There are many kind of processes, metabolic processes that occur during caloric restriction. And most of these culminate in a reduction in your energy expenditure. Your metabolism slows down basically. And that is due to various causes. And it, to a large extent that is inevitable unless you're gaining um, your energy expenditure is increasing via other means but usually because you are losing weight and often you are losing fat mass and fat free mass that's another topic where you should be losing that i don't think that a lot of people do but in practice many people do lose lean body mass when dieting mm -hmm. and lean body mass in particular uh, much much stronger so than fat mass is correlated with your metabolic rate, the more lean body mass, muscle mass, but also organ mass, 
uh, organ mass is actually even more metabolically active than muscle tissue. Um, this is strongly correlated with total energy expenditure, so your metabolic rate, basal metabolic rate as it's called. It's like how much energy your body is expending while you're just lying down, not doing anything. And um, it's not just that, but it's also that as you go progressively lower in energy intake, because of the thermic effect of food, you now have a lower energy expenditure from that as well. So this can actually amount to significant uh, differences. Many people neglect uh, dietary induced thermogenesis. It's the amount of body your um, body, the energy your body burns while processing the food you eat, basically. It's the positive effect of the food you eat on your metabolism. Mm -hmm. So if you're consuming a uh, thousand fewer calories because you went from say 3000 to 2000 calories as a male during a diet and your uh, thermic effect of food averages 20%, which is pr a pretty reasonable figure if your diet's good, uh, that's actually so 20% of a thousand. So it's 200 calories difference simply because of the reduction in thermic effect of food. If you then add say five kilogram weight loss of which uh, three kilo is fat, two kilo is muscle, not an ideal scenario, but uh, let's just give that as an example. Yeah. Uh, you can also get a reduction in metabolic rate from that. So combined with these factors, that explains a lot of the reduction you see uh, often during someone's dieting and metabolic rate. Uh, another factor that's a bit more tricky is what is called adaptive thermogenesis. Even aside from these factors that are very predictable and static, your body also sort of has a, a blueprint that depending on your fat percentage, your uh, mostly your nervous system, in fact, uh, many people think this is like thyroid related and more metabolic, but it's actually mostly your nervous system that governs uh, adaptive thermogenesis. What your nervous system does is it becomes more or less efficient or conservative with energy expenditure. So as you get leaner, this is a survival mechanism basically, your nervous system becomes more conservative with energy expenditure. So it reduces uh, in particular the components that we call spa, spontaneous uh, physical activity and need non-exercise activity from a genesis. This is basically subconscious or involuntary movement. Like right now, I'm moving my hands while I'm talking. Uh, it's something I don't do deliberately, but it's just um, these kind of movements that will be reduced. So if you see me on a podcast uh, talking on when I'm in contest shape, then you might actually notice that I'm less energetic, I'm more like robotic. So that actually adds up uh, to um, about 50% of the loss you see in um, metabolic rate can be attributed in extreme cases at least to uh, adaptive thermogenesis. So your body's trying to uh, become more efficient, more conservative with just expanding energy because it knows that energy is scarce because it registers that you have a low body fat percentage. Excellent. Now, since we're in on the topic of uh, resting metabolic rate, uh, recommendations that are often thrown out is that it, for long-term leanness, you should uh, recomposition your body by uh, decreasing fat and increasing muscle mass but how much more um, active tissue how much more uh, calories are required to maintain muscle mass compared to adipose tissue uh, a lot uh, this is quite controversial but um, adipose tissue so fat mass is often actually neglected entirely in formulas that estimate someone's basal metabolic rate because the effect of like one kilo of fat mass maintaining that um, over a day for the body it's it's almost trivial in many cases so many formulas actually don't even take fat mass into account it's very very little difference because uh, many people think fat mass isn't metabolically active at all it is it actually it can produce hormones uh, it has its own vascular system uh, it's involved with the immune system, so it does have a lot of functions that people don't know about, but still, it's not that active. So it's, you know, it's largely a storage depot for your body, just where energy goes for later use. Uh, muscle tissue, on the other hand, is very metabolically active. Um, I know that some people uh, are skeptical of the relevance of this as well, but pretty much every formula we have shows that uh, fat-free mass or lean body mass and basal metabolic rate are correlated with increases in many studies being found 
um, that if you increase someone's muscle mass or at least lean body mass, this translates into a significant increase in energy expenditure. And if you're looking at, say, uh, bodybuilders versus non-bodybuilders, you can get 20% differences. In many studies, it's closer to like 5 10% increases. And depending on which study you look at, you're often looking at about 20 calories uh, per day per kilo of um, lean body mass or extra lean body mass being expended. But that adds up significantly. Uh, it's compounded when you're also doing uh, activity, so during strength training, for for example, because the more muscle you have, uh, you can also lift more weight, but it's also more uh, tissue that is now being carried. So the more active you are, the greater the difference between a sedentary and a very muscular individual become. Interesting. Now, moving on to the next question, uh, we talked about some of the adaptations that may occur during uh, caloric restriction. And a term that's been used uh, a lot re in recent years is metabolic damage could you please explain what that is and how that that like that theory dif uh, differs from what actually happens in the body right so metabolic damage um there are some offers that use it in different ways uh, but the bayesian research team has uh, written a paper from this and published it actually um, a scientific paper and in that we use the definition that i believe is most commonly um, used in the literature and in colloquial everyday usage and that is that metabolic damage refers formally to a decrease in energy expenditure that lasts even um, beyond the period of dieting so even after you have regained uh, your original body composition and it is larger than simply uh, what you would expect from changes in energy intake and body composition. So what I was just talking about, um, it is inevitable that if your weight goes down, uh, your lean body mass goes down, your energy intake goes down, then your metabolism goes down, it becomes slower as well. There is no way around that. There's no way to circumvent it. But metabolic damage posits that there is actually a greater decrease, for example, this adaptive formogenesis, and that this persists even after the diet. So it's basically, that's the idea of your metabolism becoming damaged. It's not just an adaptation. It's actually a, an irreversible, a permanent kind of damage. Okay, perfect. Now, wh when we're on the subject, like these adapt adaptations that um, occur sometimes, if you, um, is it based on fat mass or uh, on body weight as a total? Because we've seen a couple of studies that show that you fully recover to... Uh, your normal arrested metabolic rate if you go back to your original weight but is it is it um, is it just the fat mass that the body regulates this with or is it total body weight yeah there are actually uh, different ideas about this uh, what we found in our analysis and what a large body of literature supports is that it's mostly fat free mass like we talked about it's muscle tissue lean body mass and in particular organ mass that is a lot more metabolically active so the, the fat tissue isn't isn't that important but some offers like uh, the Lou et al they have actually posited some fat high, fat stores uh, memory which is sort of a different version of metabolic damage where they posit that your body sort of remembers how much fat it had and then it, it it reduces your metabolic rate so that you get that back excellent Okay, man. So, so um, you mentioned that you recently did um, a review uh, study with your research team. Uh, could you tell us more about um, the study? What, what if there were any specific papers that uh, that that you looked at, and what your actually findings were on this topic? Yeah, sure. So, what we did is uh, we looked at this topic, metabolic damage, and these kind of hypotheses like fat storage memory, and we put them to the test. So, we actually uh, started investigating all kinds of fields in the literature where we had people that dieted and then got their weight back and were carefully monitored during this entire period. Mm -hmm. And the most classic case of that is the Minnesota starvation experiment where they actually semi-starved. It was controlled, but it was kind of starvation because they ended up at, I think it was 5.3% or something, body fat, which is basically natural competitive bodybuilding level and these guys were only they were active but not strength training 
So that is, you know, as good, as uh, uh, aggressive as you can get in a research study. And the only reason uh, that we have such an awesome study is because this is in the World War II period where they were allowed to do this kind of drastic research because they actually wanted to know what the effects of starvation were. Mm -hmm. And this has basically been um, kind of the light version has been done a few times. A popular one, another popular one is the biosphere experiment where they put people in very controlled conditions like in a lab, they watch what they eat, they monitor their blood work, their metabolic rate, they uh, put them, they measure um, indirect or direct calorimetry, so you know that what their energy expenditure is. And over a certain period, they lose weight, they gain it back, you can see exactly what happens to their metabolism. And in all of these experiments, we basically found that there was no evidence of metabolic damage. What we did, uh, which was a novel method in the literature, uh, because a lot of literature finds conflicting um, findings in that people return to their original weight, but their metabolism may still be lower, or they don't monitor energy intake, for example. But you need to look, um, we did, look at the ratio of their actual uh, adaptation in metabolic rate and compare it to the predicted level based on their body composition. Mm -hmm. So you have very good formulas in the literature that can predict someone's metabolic rate based on their body composition. And it's only when you see that this ratio changes that you actually have evidence of metabolic damage. Otherwise, all you're saying is that people with a lower body weight have a lower metabolic rate. And that's not exactly shocking news. Mm -hmm. But that's what a lot of studies found. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did with that ratio is we found that this ratio gets back to its baseline level as soon as you regain your body composition. Actually, there were a surprising uh, couple findings where people reverted to a higher or a higher metabolic rate after the diet than before. Uh, we also looked at extreme cases, um, insofar as the Minnesota starvation experiment wasn't extreme enough. Yeah. We also looked at malnourished individuals, uh, like uh, women with anorexia nervosa. And even in that scenario, there was no evidence of metabolic damage. So that's pretty extreme. Also, there were two case studies on bodybuilders, of course, most relevant for at least my clientele. Mm -hmm. And one good study on competitive wrestlers who also use pretty aggressive um, strategies to lose a lot of weight and then get back up in their off season to their original body composition. So in, in all of these cases, we found that when people regain their original body composition, particularly their muscle mass, that they have the exact same metabolic rate as before. Mm -hmm. It's good news, especially for bodybuilders. And if you think about it, it's really um, not that um, not that odd because if there was something like metabolic damage, then you'd expect bodybuilders, for example, or any kind of physique athlete, uh, also the wrestlers, for example, to basically, after 20 years of competing, have absolutely no metabolism left, right? Because every diet you'd expect them to incur some damage. Mm -hmm. But what I see, at least in my client, is uh, often because as a result of tweaking everything, gaining a bit more muscle mass, you find that they can get to stage weight uh, or stage leanness uh, at a bit higher energy intake every competition. So it's, if anything, it's the opposite, what the trend suggests. Um, so all very good news um, showing that Yes, you have these adaptations that occur, but they all they are all reversible. Okay, excellent. I have two. I have actually two follow-up questions based on what you just said. You mentioned that some studies actually showed that basal metabolic rate were higher than what they were at baseline when they returned to their normal caloric intake. Was there a difference in body composition when they returned back, or was it similar to what they started at at baseline? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Usually it was that their body composition was the same, at least statistically, significantly speaking, and their metabolism was higher. And uh, this was mostly found in the studies on women with anorexia nervosa. Mm -hmm. And my uh, um, hypothesis here is we, we cannot investigate this because we don't have the full long-term data of the women actually losing the weight because it would be unethical to have them, uh, you know, suffer from their eating disorder. Um, but uh, my hypothesis is that what I also see in my clients, I have coached uh, quite a few women with anorexia nervosa, is that they have a higher than average 
um, basal metabolic rate as a genetic effect, mm -hmm. which all to ironically everyone but these women would be an absolute blessing. But for them, it's actually sort of a curse because they have to eat a lot more. For you have these, you know, women that weigh 30, 40 kilos, and they have to consume almost 3,000 calories sometimes just to be weight stable. So that's not what you normally see. No. Okay. Um, another another question. Uh, another study actually that was mentioned in your review paper was the the biggest loser study. Mm -hmm. Could you um, could you explain a bit about that study? Yeah. So they basically found that people that lost uh, a lot of weight had a lower uh, metabolic rate uh, when they regained a lot of the weight back. Mm -hmm. But they didn't uh, actually get to the point, in most cases, where they had full recovery of muscle mass. So it, it's inconclusive insofar as saying that when you do get that muscle mass back, you still have a reduction in metabolic rate. So uh, we're in the process actually of analyzing this as well as some other literature on obesive individuals to make that case clearly. But um, at least we can say already that you cannot conclude from that that there is metabolic damage. Mm -hmm. No, because that's that's usually the paper that people point to when they say that mm -hmm. metabolic damage is a, is a real thing. But do you think that it, like, do you think that it might be any individual variance in that some people get affected from a permanent change in the rest of metabolic rate after doing severe caloric restriction? What are, what are your opinions about that? I think that. Um, it is definitely to some extent true, and I base this mostly on my clients, that some obese individuals just have a genetically lower metabolic rate than non-obese individuals. Most research on this is does not find striking differences. So it's absolutely not the case that, you know, if you're overweight now, then, and you're hearing this and you're thinking, oh, okay, I'm screwed. Probably not. Mm -hmm. But it is, in my experience, uh, there is a slight difference. So that can explain when you're using these standardized formulas that they will overestimate metabolic rate, what the metabolic rate should be of these individuals. So that might explain some of it. Uh, the only scenario in which I personally um, think that metabolic damage can actually occur is in women uh, that go without their menstrual uh, phase for a long time and end up staying in contest shape for a period of usually you're talking years. Mm -hmm. And I've not actually seen any hard evidence of metabolic damage, but I've certainly seen in some women, some clients that come to me, for example, that they say, okay, so I've done um, four competitive seasons in a row, um, spring, fall, spring, fall, spring, fall, and they basically want to retain that stage condition uh, year round all the time. And then if you look at their blood work, it's really bad. You're looking at, uh, they basically, they're basically hypothyroid, uh, they have uh, often low estrogen levels in particular, also low testosterone levels. So it would not surprise me at all if you're then talking about uh, metabolic damage. But again, the question is, if someone's, if their metabolism will not simply return to baseline if you spend enough time back at a healthy fat percentage consuming a nutritious diet. Because we have one recent study actually on this that looked at this, but only for one contest cycle. And they found that women um, as soon as they spend enough time back in positive uh, energy balance, they all revert it back to normal health, hormonally speaking. So that's uh, more evidence that it's again adaptations and um, there's no long-term damage, but at least it can take a long time to recover uh, in this scenario. Yeah, because that was my, actually my follow-up question that if you done caloric restriction for an uh, extended amount of time, like say you're always competing as a bikini competitor, for example, and you're expecting to have your normal resting metabolic rate after six months, but you've been dieting for two or three years, it's, it's probably more, to, more uh, a time question when it will mm. return back uh, than a permanent uh, damage like we talked about. Yeah. Exactly. So, this, yeah. These so, hormones yeah. have a lot longer time course uh, to recover from because in this case, it's not really that your metabolism is damaged. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, your nervous system or 
uh, your mitochondria, you know, energy production per se, it's the hormones that, which are basically the messengers that are no longer sending the right messengers that uh, optimize your metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Now, another another uh, term that we often hear about when we're talking about metabolic jamming is is the is the cure for meta metabolic damage and that's is reverse dieting that's been very popular amongst uh, competitive uh, bodybuilders and fitness athletes could you explain a little bit about the, the concept behind reverse dieting so right yeah reverse dieting is uh, in its most literal um, definition which i think not many people adhere to anymore but there are certainly uh, and, and there were uh, some people that incorporated it like this is that you literally reverse the diet. So if you're plotting someone's energy intake over time, over say a six month contest prep, and then you flip it around. So they started at 3000 and ended at 1500, just to give an example for say a woman, then it will take you six months of reverse dieting to get back to that 3000 um, calories energy intake. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the problem here is that often, when at, at first when you are literally reversing the diet what happens is that these initial slight increases that correspond with the slight decreases you did before still have people in a deficit so you're not actually increasing their metabolic rate at all you just have them you're actually prolonging the contest prep even after the show mm -hmm. and then you have a long period in which they are hoovering around maintenance and then only often a few weeks or months after the actual contest, do you have them back in positive energy balance? So it's it needlessly prolongs the contest prep basically. And then of course the next question is: uh, Is this more effective to increase their metabolic rate than uh, doing it faster? Mm -hmm. And this is actually what this, uh, the one of the studies that we investigated in our paper also investigated, which was the Minnesota starvation experiment, is they put people in different groups. And these different groups had a different energy intake. So some people reverted back to their original body composition a lot faster because they ate more and other people did it more slowly, progressively. So you could say that these people were actually reverse dieting. And we found that it doesn't matter. As long as you re reach your initial body composition, particularly your muscle mass level, again, you get the same metabolic rate as you did before. So it, you can do it fast or slow. And if you do it slow, it just basically prolongs the suffering of contest prep um, unnecessarily long. Uh, what we do find is that, um, or actually additionally, what we found is that energy intake also has an acute effect on your basal metabolic rate, which is not that large, but it means that as soon as you put someone in positive energy balance, and most people experience this themselves as well, uh, you actually get increased in metabolism, which is why uh, often when you get from, say, someone has been contest prep and at the end they were in a 5% deficit and then you put them in a 5% surplus, often then the next week or the next two weeks or something, you can increase their meta or their energy intake again and again because their metabolism is increasing now. So for these two reasons, uh, it just prolongs how long it will take to reach your initial uh, muscle mass, get your muscle mass back. And because you are in a lower state of energy balance, uh, reverse dieting actually just prolongs how long it will take to get the same metabolic rate back. And uh, there, there's no reason to do it. The only benefit, because th there is a benefit uh, of reverse dieting, I would say, is that it's, um, it swings the pendulum in the other direction from what usually happens, which is the post-contest binge. A lot of people don't have a plan for post-contest, they think, um, it, or people that cut in general after weight loss diet, the whole idea of a diet has gotten this um, this uh, stigma as being like this period where you suffer and you get results, and then after the diet you go back to your original lifestyle. So that's why people yo-yo diet, why people get fat after a contest. They don't have any plan. They just they start eating like crazy again. And when you put a contest competitor that's been energy deprived for a period of months and you give them unlimited access to food with no more self-restraint and often no uh, training uh, either in this period, you can do a lot of damage. Like I've seen a lot of competitors that literally undid their entire contest prep 
within a matter of weeks and sometimes within just one weekend they all they do weeks sometimes months of damage because mm -hmm. you're really looking at and i've experienced this myself your appetite is outrageous after months of being energy deprived and being really really lean so you can do very very serious damage and in that regard as sort of a counter movement to this uh, this, this kind of binging behavior, uh, reverse dieting definitely makes a lot of sense. It just swung the pendulum too far in the other direction. Yeah, exactly. But what, like, what, what type of recommendations would you have when you're coming off a pre-contest diet and you're going to transition into a, an off-season diet or a bulking phase? How would you like do? You, run it by percentages how much you increase it do you increase it back to what were uh, maintenance from the, from the start of the diet what what type of practical tips do you have there right so what you want to do is you want to find the middle road and in this case the middle road is that you have to look at what energy deficit you are in now and you correct for that and you immediately go to the kind of surplus you want to be in so say you want to go from a 5% deficit to a 5% surplus, that means you can increase caloric intake by at least 10%. And I say at least because you get this effect of energy balance on uh, energy intake and increase from the thermic effect of food. So you can go with an at least 10% increase from, from the start, like from competition day to the next day. But what you do not want to do is look at your original energy intake before the contest prep and go right back to that level mm -hmm. because you may have started off with a maintenance calorie intake of 3000 calories but that may now because of these metabolic adaptations it may now be 2000 calories so if you go back to 3000 you are suddenly in a thousand calorie surplus and that's a bit much yeah. so um, that's what you, you want to do you want to look at what kind of energy deficit you are in now and not what your maintenance was before, but you estimate your new maintenance based on your new body composition, and then you go to your desired surplus, which in my experience for most contest competitors shouldn't be more than 10% uh, energy surplus. Excellent. Now, uh, would you uh, slowly increase it after that? Like how much would you increase it on a, like let's talk about how much would you increase it on a weekly or a monthly basis and what type of tracking do you do to determine if you need to increase the calories right so it basically works the same way as any other kind of uh, bulk and the only difference here is that often you have a bit more leeway in terms of uh, how fast you can add weight and that's the most important thing because you want to see for one uh, how lean does the individual want to stay some people just they don't care about um, you know retaining contest shape and they're fine with sort of dirty bulking a bit um, but not going crazy so uh, just a controlled bulk and other people they want to uh, stay especially models and repeat competitors want to stay really lean uh, but not be an energy deficit anymore so that that determines the client's goals if you're looking at just what is physiologically optimal, then often you want them to be in say five to 10% uh, energy surplus max. And you want to look at how quickly they're increasing their muscle mass again. So if you uh, got a competitor that lost a lot of muscle mass, you can be more aggressive afterward as well because they're now gaining a lot of muscle mass. And you should see in the measurements that you're doing, uh, there are many kind of ways that you can do. You can use bioelectrical impedance analysis, those kind of scales. Um, you can just go by weight, um, which is often uh, all that people have. You can also use skinfold calipers. You can use circumferences. They all have their pros and their cons. I'm not sure how much detail they want to go into every method. Ideally, you'd have a client that does DEXA scans or something on a weekly or two-weekly basis. Uh, but even if you're just looking at weight, you monitor their weight increase. And based on that, you should see that it's positive, but it's not too much. So it's not above the uh, realistic expectation of uh, what that individual can gain in terms of muscle mass. And uh, when you do this, you should see that over the course of um, the reverse diet, as you could call it, or the bulk, uh, the lean bulk, um, it goes progressively up because they're gaining more muscle mass, their energy 
um, intake should be increasing, the energy expenditure should be increasing. So it means that they can get progressively more and more food throughout this bulk phase. Excellent. Now I have I have one last question before we summarize everything we talked about. Uh, you mentioned um, that uh, being in a surplus during a diet, like having a refeed day, higher calories uh, a day, uh, might um, might uh, reverse some of these adaptations that occur during a diet. Uh, do you feel? Do you think that it, it's enough to have like one refeed day, or should you have more? Uh, refeed day after each other like for instance two days in a row or is it enough to just have one day before you go back to calorie restriction um, yeah it depends on what you do, uh, mean by a refeed I'm not really a fan of the um, kind of traditional refeeding protocols where you have you know a, a drastic increase in carbohydrate intake on one day because what you often see if you're looking at carbohydrate overfeeding protocols or basically refeeding protocols uh, people tout all these benefits as increased leptin increased energy expenditure if you're really looking at the numbers you're talking about hefty sur energy surpluses like sometimes 50 percent 20 30 percent energy surplus and then you're looking at an increase in energy expenditure of a few percent five percent maybe ten percent if you're if you're lucky basically yeah. and the increases in leptin are similarly uh, quite trivial from a physiological point of view. More importantly, uh, it yes, it's enough to get your metabolism up and uh, increase leptin production, but it's also increased to instantly, it's also enough to instantly seize fat loss. And as soon as you get back into your energy deficit afterwards, uh, we see that leptin goes right back down because your body actually doesn't register. It's a lot smarter than just registering carbohydrates or energy intake. It registers energy balance, and in particular, it simply registers total fat mass. And it's like fat mass secretes leptin, so it makes sense. Um, so you cannot really trick your body that way into, uh, you know, believing that it's now well fed. It knows what kind, what your fat mass is. So mm -hmm. as soon as you get back into the energy deficit, leptin production goes right back down. So it's you know often the best case scenario is you're halting the diet, and that can be used. As a psychological tool, I'm not really a fan of it, but um, you could make that argument or as a kind of diet break, or it can be used and be successful in some cases, especially if it's just a moderate uh, refeed, more like calorie cycling, I would call it, than actual carbohydrate refeeding, uh, because it makes sure that your weekly total or your total energy deficit over time isn't too large, because that's a mistake a lot of people make during dieting. They have a too aggressive energy deficit. And they're used to that working when they, you know, were still chubby and starting to their just their six pack walks coming in. But when you go from six pack to veins on your quads and striations in your glutes, you do not want to be in say a 30% deficit. There is no uh, contest competitor that will do well, at least not a natural one, on such a drastic uh, energy deficit. So sometimes refeeds work, but it's then usually the case that they were just too aggressive with the diet at other times than that the refeed really did the trick. Excellent. So what's your preferred method during... Uh, I know you do training day and non-training day, is that correct? Or... Uh, yeah, I use what I call anabolic window calorie cycling. Mm -hmm. So it's not just training and rest days. I actually look at the, uh, the anabolic window, which is... Uh, not your typical bro science idea of like this window one hour around the training session. It's actually the whole period of uh, muscle protein synthesis. Strictly speaking, it's a delay in the muscle flow effect. So it's an increase in the ceiling of muscle protein synthesis. After a workout, uh, you get a spike in protein synthesis and that can last over 72 hours in certain research, in certain conditions. And during this period, you get this rapid spike, especially in the first 16 hours or so. Uh, depending on how advanced you are, which is, goes back to our previous podcast that people can uh, search this up on. Mm -hmm. um, this is the period where I generally put most nutrients. And there is some evidence that this uh, calorie cycling is, even works. At least there's one study um, that found that calorie cycling um, resulted in an increased fat loss compared to having the same energy deficit across the entire week. So a flat, constant energy intake. 
And a research review paper by Varadi et al. also find that uh, calorie cycling might increase uh, fat or fat-free mass retention. So um, if you combine this with uh, this anabolic window theory that in strength trainees, you should have better nutrient partitioning after the workouts, you get these kind of wave-like patterns in someone's calorie intake. And the more advanced they are, the more emphasis there come, becomes on the immediate post-workout period. That's also what um, Mori found, a Japanese researcher, in uh, what's well, not that recent anymore, I think it was 2015, 14, had a really excellent paper, looked at untrained individuals and trained individuals, and looked at whether it mattered how quickly after their workout they consumed uh, protein. And they found that in untrained individuals it didn't matter, which makes sense because they have this huge, very long anabolic window, which lasts you know, maybe over three days. Whereas in these in the bodybuilders, you actually start the bodybuilders. Um, although, you know, if you're looking at the stats, they didn't seem that impressive. But at least they call themselves bodybuilders, and there it did matter. So that supports that the more advanced you get, it becomes more relevant to look at this post-workout period. Uh, and then I'm not talking about like a 30-minute or one-hour post-workout period, but more talking about the hours after a training session that you want to be well nourished. Yeah, interesting. I actually remember we. We sat actually next to each other when, when that paper came out. We were in Beitostern mm -hmm. in, uh, at AFPT in 2000, 2014. I think so, yeah. That was, well, I think it was quickly, um, it was like a few days after uh, that paper came out. Because I remember when that paper came out, it was funny because I was actually presenting this uh, with Berge Fagerli mm -hmm. uh, at a seminar. And we had this theory and we um, discussed this theory on Saturday. Yeah. And then on Sunday, I think it was, I'm not sure what the exact days were, this paper came out or it hit publication. And we we're like, okay, so this is basically what we saw yesterday. And now we have this scientific paper that basically did the exact experiment we, we wanted to have. And it, it found that this theory, uh, or it supported the theory. Yeah. So it was probably good answer because there was a, during my tour in Norway that we were at the FPT together. Yeah, exactly. All right, Benno. So yeah. let's uh, let's wrap it up with uh, a summary, like a take-home message of uh, the topic we've been discussing. Um, mm -hmm. What's the take-home message on metabolic damage and uh, uh, reverse dieting? All right. So metabolic damage um, is a myth. There is no damage, but there are metabolic adaptations, and generally, during a diet, your metabolism will slow down. Uh, you should take this into account because you do not want to revert back to your initial initial maintenance energy intake after a diet. You want to go to your new maintenance, taking into account these adaptations. So uh, you don't have to do a full reverse diet where you literally reverse the entire diet. But you do want to find that middle road between needlessly prolonging um, the deficit and the diet and jumping right back into your original uh, energy intake before the diet. Excellent. All right, Manu, thank you so much for uh, coming back on the podcast. Thanks to everyone that's uh, listened to this uh, episode. Uh, before we, um, before we, uh, we leave, Manu, uh, could, could you tell us where people can find more information about you? Sure, yeah. Uh, Bayesian Bodybuilding should have all uh, the information, free articles and stuff. Um, that you can check out. Uh, you can probably pro probably find the links um, if you're at YouTube now uh, in the description below. Uh, we're on every social media channel known to man, I think, right now. But we're big on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So check it out if you're interested. Excellent. And uh, you also uh, could we also ask when you're going to speak? Uh, you have some speaking engagements uh, the next couple of months. Yeah, um, actually, quite a few. Um, I'm touring India, um, which may already be happening when people uh, are listening or, uh, or viewing this. Um, then afterwards, I'll be in the Netherlands. I have a couple uh, speaking engagements, but most of those are for course members only for the PT course. Uh, then I also have a big fitness conference um, in June that a lot of really good speakers um, are going to be there, um, which is in the Netherlands in Amsterdam. 
And in October and September, October, early October, I'm touring Australia. And I'll have three seminars there looking at Melbourne, Sydney, and Perth. And then afterwards, uh, this is actually a new announcement. I'm talking with Eric Helms to do a seminar in Auckland, New Zealand on 16 October. So we've got a nice schedule ahead this year. Nice. So you got a busy schedule. That's uh, that's great to hear. And for people that have never heard uh, Menno speak, I would uh, highly recommend if you get the opportunity to hear him speak to to go there. Thanks, man. Thank you. Okay, Menno. Uh, thank you so much once again, and I wish you a pleasant trip to India as the next stop, right? Yep, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, man. Take right. care, and thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do this podcast. My pleasure. Goodbye. Okay. Talk soon. Bye bye.